if you're a person who have experienced painful failure in marriage, I don't want you to sit there with guilt all over your face and heart and say, well, this is what I should have done and I didn't do this. Look, God is the God of mercy. He's God of grace. And you need to look forward and not back. Because I can tell you, and many of you know the truth of what I'm going to tell you, that perhaps the deception of Satan in our culture has not been greater in any area than the area of marriage relationship. This deception is of biblical proportion, and it really is. Look around you with the acceleration of sexual sins and homosexuality and infidelity and militant feminism and male chauvinism and quick and no-fault divorce and serial marriages. And these are but just the symptoms and the evidence of the fact that we have been snookered by that deceiver, that we have experienced that deception that Eve experienced firsthand. The deception that says that God's blueprint for a happy marriage, that God's blueprint for a joyous marriage, that God's blueprint for the betterment and the good of society is oppressive. That's the deception that we have experienced in the last 40 years or so. Just think about this. The wonderful foundation that God, our maker, who netted us, who created us men and women, who, who, who made us, the wonderful foundation that He gave us for a happy and joyous and fulfilled family and therefore society is now described by many as primitive and as outmoded and therefore ought to be rejected. And this deception is not only, you see it in the television commercials and in the television programmings, but you see it and you hear it preached from many a pulpits in America today. That's the saddest part of all. The same serpent that came to Eve in the garden and said, did really God mean this and brought doubt to her heart is the same deceiver who is misleading millions of people in our culture today. God's blueprint for the husband to lovingly and caringly exercise spiritual headship and for the wife to lovingly and thoughtfully affirm that headship, that is oppressive today and therefore must be rejected according to our culture. The truth is this, as my British friend would say, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the tasting. <laughs> and the proof is, is all around us, and we can't deny it. We, we see it. The result of rejection of God's blueprint is self-evident. And what with broken marriages and, and suffering children and selfish relationships and fear of commitment on the part of many, they're all proof that we have been snookered, that we've been duped uh, by that same serpent of old. So many of the so-called militant feminists are going around saying the Bible is wrong. And what they're doing is they're misinterpreting the Bible. They are twisting the meaning of its message. They are maligning the true benefits that God intended for husbands and wives to have. So much so that many Christians have been bullied. Wonderful true believers have been bullied into believing this lie and this misinterpretation of the Word of God. So much so that many Christians today are embarrassed about these verses. And they almost wish they were not in the Bible. Now, I think that those merchants of misery not only brought misery on themselves, they want to put it on us too. They want, to, they want to share it with us, and we refuse to accept it. I, for one, I can tell you, and I speak for thousands of believers in this place, I refuse to be bullied into falsehood and believing untruths and misinterpretation of the Scripture. To my knowledge, only Jesus Christ and the Christian faith is the true liberator of women. You check me on that. <laughs> The New Testament stands bold in declaring that both men and women are equal in the sight of God. The New Testament boldly declares that God loves men and women equally. The New Testament boldly declares that both husband and wife are to submit to one another. Look at verse 21, which is the foundational verse. 
Submit to one another out of reverence for the Lord. And yet the enemies of the Bible ignore this verse. They skip this verse, which is the foundational verse for the rest of the marriage relationship that Paul talk, goes on to talk about. But you see, before Paul can even talk about the role of the wife and the husband, before he can talk about those special roles that God has intended for each to have, he emphasizes that both must submit to one another before God. Both are equal before God. When Paul was writing to the Ephesians, the believers in Ephesus, there were three melting cultures in that city, just as most of the Roman cities, but particularly in Ephesus. There was the ancient Jewish culture, there was the Greek culture, and there was the Roman culture. And they were all bubbling together in that big city. In the Jewish culture, at that time, women were treated like things. And that is why a Jewish man every morning in the Old Testament would get up and pray, I thank you, Lord, that I am a Jew, not a Gentile, free, not a slave, man, not a woman. That was his, his daily prayer. The women did not fare much better in the Greek culture. Uh, they were kept out of sight and in total obedience to their husbands. Uh, Xenophon, who is a Greek writer, writes and explains, he said, the reason for this, and I quote, that she might see as little as possible, hear as little as possible, and ask as little as possible. End of quote. The Roman culture was not much better either for women. It was a disaster uh, because women had no right whatsoever. In fact, under the Roman law, women were equal to children. Seneca, the Roman writer, writes, he said, women were married to be divorced and divorced to be married. And in the midst of this horrible melting of three cultures, the Apostle Paul comes in and he says, submit to one another out of reverence for God. Ah, that's a revolutionary thinking. That was, not, that was not something they even understood or comprehended before. I want you to hear me right. This is really important. As far as I'm concerned, this is true women's liberation. This is true women's freedom. This is true equality in God's eyes. The fact that the Bible assigns different roles for husbands from uh, different roles for wives should be freeing, not oppressing. It should be fulfilling, not oppressing. But listen, if we are really truthful, if we're honest, if we're really honest and truthful with ourselves, we would have to admit that the reason why we are drowning in an ocean of books and tapes and seminars and conferences and, and, and counselors and, and on marriage and on sex is because we just don't want to accept God's blueprints. <laughs> We want to find something else. We agree with us. We just don't want to accept that. Because we don't want to accept God's blueprints for joyous marriage, we run around thinking, man, if I just read the latest book by Dr. Smilfungus on marriage, oh, I'll be all right. My marriage will be okay. If, if I just go to that next seminar by Super Duck over there, he's got this seminar charging $25 or $50, whatever they charge for seminars now, about marriage, my marriage will work. Here's all you need. Ephesians chapter 5. That's all you need. Somebody going on and said, man, if I can just find a pastor or a counselor who agrees with me and, and, and take my side against my spouse, I'll be all right. <laughs> Beloved, I want to plead with you. You need to stop today as you hear the Word of God. I want to plead with you to say, God, teach me your blueprint and help me to live by them, whatever the future may hold for me. Now, those of you who were here last Sunday, just raise your hand. Well, many of you. Well, thank you. I, and I'm not trying to guilt the others for not being here, although it's not beyond the realm of possibility for me to do that. But... <laughs> But I really don't. That is not my motive. That's not. I have a reason for asking you this. Because if this is a, a marathon of preaching, and if I just continued on from the last message, those two messages are linked together. Because the message from Paul, not from me, but the word from the Word of God, was about 
being commanded to continuously being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. You see, before Paul can talk about relationships in, between husband and wife and, and parents and children and, and, and relationships at the workplace, before he could get to that, he had to start by talking about be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we looked at that imperative mood in the passive voice and why it is a command. Because those who are constantly being filled of the Holy Spirit, those who are moment by moment being filled of the Holy Spirit, they will truly find fulfillment in God's blueprints for marriage. Without the inner filling of the Holy Spirit, it's a power struggle. It's a war zone. Without being continuously filled with the Holy Spirit, there's no acceptance of the roles that God gave each, the husband and the wife. Without the inner filling of the Holy Spirit, there can be no forgiveness. Without the inner filling of the Holy Spirit, there is no submission to one another. Without the inner filling of the Holy Spirit continuously, there is no sacrifice for the other. When Paul said, wives, submit to your husbands, and husbands, love your wives, he is saying that in a partnership of a Christian marriage, and I'm talking about a Christian marriage, in a partnership in a Christian marriage, the wife brings in different contribution in that relationship, that the wife brings a distinct role for that relationship, that the wives receive fulfillment in exercising that role in the marriage relationship. Now, the enemies of the Bible take a beautiful word, the word submission, and they twist it. And they say, see, it's in the Bible. It means subjugation, and it means subordination. Not, not in your life. That is not our Bible. That is not our teaching. That is not the Christian faith. That word means nothing of the sort. First, you cannot separate the wife's submission from her husband's headship. And the two must go together. The two are inseparable. The two are inexorably linked together. Leadership in the Christian home, the headship in the Christian home, must be in the model of Christ. It has to be. Otherwise, it's not in the Christian marriage. How did Jesus Christ exercise headship? Listen to me very carefully. By serving, by giving, by sacrificing, uh, by putting his bride, the church, first, and even dying for her. And who wouldn't want to submit to this kind of loving leadership? Now, beloved, it is very, very important to realize that marriage is not a power struggle. Once you get into a power struggle, you're going to discover that there's either the wife refuses to be spirit-filled in her role of submission, or the husband refuses to be spirit-filled in his role of servant leadership, or both. God's plan for marriage is not for the exhortation of the husband and the suppression of the wife. That is not the New Testament. God's plan when it is fully obeyed and when it is fully followed, brings greater joy to a marriage than you can experience in ten lifetimes. Now, did you notice here, look at the passage again, did you notice how the Apostle Paul used twice as many verses in speaking to husbands as he does addressing the wives? Did you see that? You say, why is that? Well, women are fast on the uptake. <laughs> they get it much quicker than men. And Men needed twice as much explanation to get it. <laughs> but listen, in all seriousness, it is because loving is more demanding than submitting. It's because it is a fact that one can submit without loving, but you can never love without submitting. In reality, when you love, you will place the needs of the beloved ahead of yours. When you love, you will place the welfare of the beloved ahead of yours. When you love, you will place the desire of the beloved ahead of yours. When you love, you place the preference of the beloved ahead of yours. You will place the comfort of the beloved ahead of yours. And why do you think the Scripture goes on to say to the husbands to love their wives 
as Christ loved the church. And he repeats it three times. Why? Well, you say, what did Christ do for his bride? Listen, he lifted the glories of heaven. You and I will never understand what that is until we get there, until we see with our spiritual eyes we can imagine, we can read the Scripture until we know what the splendor and the glory of God is like. We'll never understand what it means for the Lord Jesus Christ to leave that splendor and come to earth, to a world that hated Him, to a world that mocked Him, to a world that cursed Him, to a world that ultimately crucified Him. Jesus put his own needs, his own likes, his own desires, his own welfare aside so that he may redeem his bride, so that he may save his bride, so that he may cleanse his bride. Love wants only the best for the one it loves. Love can never stand idly by watching the beloved suffer any evil or harm. Love can never be passive when the beloved is in danger. Love never entices the beloved to do the wrong thing. And so when Paul is talking about submitting in everything, he's talking about every good thing. If a husband ever asked his wife to lie, she has every right to refuse to submit to him. If a husband asks his wife to commit sin, she has to say with the apostles, God must be obeyed first. You need to understand, this is pure Scripture. Look at verses 25 and 26. He loved this bride, the church, by cleansing her and washing with water through the Word so that he may present her to himself in her glory without spot or wrinkle. I'm watching those wrinkles now coming on my face, you know. I mean, you don't see me before I have makeup, but no, I don't put makeup on. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and I was thinking about this and was really thinking about this this week. I said, man, the Holy Spirit is going to give you the best Botox that money can buy. <laughs> He's going to get rid of all those wrinkles and those spots, all the sins and rebellions, all the things we're conscious of that absolutely brings us down again and again and again. They're going to be cleansed day by day. How? By the inner filling of the Holy Spirit and constantly moving from one point of glory into another, cleansed, purified, until we see Him face to face in glory. He continuously cleanses us and purifies us and beloved, what a wife in her right mind does not want to submit, affirm, honor, respect, delight, follow, build up this kind of love. Let me tell you five things. No, I'm not going to expound on them. Just give, the, give you the headlines. It's five things about this blueprint of God for a joyous, contented, happy marriage. First, submission is not a dirty word. Far from it. So much so that the Apostle Paul proceeds by, by the injunction saying, submit to one another. It's not a dirty word. Jesus, Philippians said, although he was equal with God, and yet he did not consider that equality to be something to grab hold of and never let go of, but he did. He let go of it so that he may come and die for his bride. He submitted to God the Father. So I have a question for you today. Did God the Son become inferior to God the Father because he submitted to him? Hello? No. God bless you. No, and a million no. The thought of superiority and inferiority is not in the New Testament. It's not biblical. Jesus submitted to the Father. Submission is a beautiful word. Secondly, the wife's submission is a submission to a lover, not to a boss. The third thing about in, this, in the blueprint here, the husband's headship is serving not lording it over his wife. Paul 
repeats the word three times. Love like Christ loved the church. Nourish like Christ nourishes. Cherish like Christ cherishes the church. Lead like Christ led the church and leads the church. Four, husbands are to sacrifice like Christ sacrificed. Five verbs in verses 25 and 26. You can circle them in your Bible. Love, gave, cleansed, sanctified, present. present. Number five, the wife's submission is not but a response to her husband's love. Honoring of her husband's love. Lifting him up. God created men and women for different roles. And ladies, God has called you to respond to your husband's love by lifting him up, by encouraging him, not beat him down. That's all that God asking of you to do. And husbands, God called us above all to put our wives and their needs ahead of ours. I want to tell you this as I conclude. This is the very core of the Christian message. This is the very core of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This what distinguishes the Christian faith from all the other religions. Listen carefully. The very essence of the Christian marriage is Christ's relationship with His bride, the church, the believers, from every nation and every generation. And until the husband and wife both learn to give themselves individually, totally to Christ, and experience the joy that comes from self-giving to Christ, they will not know the joy of giving themselves totally to one another. Until you experience what it is to lose yourself in Christ so that you may find yourself, you will not experience the joy that comes from losing yourself in your spouse in order that you may truly find fulfillment. Beloved, listen to me. This is the essence of the Christian faith. This is the secret to fulfillment in life. The God who made us gave us that secret. This is the ultimate in self-actualization. The world is running around and saying self-actualization, you can get it by looking out for number one. And God said, no, that is the secret for misery. You may look okay on the outside, but deep down, you're empty. Because that's now how fulfillment and self-actualization could ever happen. The secret for true joy and commitment in life, God said, comes from giving ourselves to others without reservation. It comes from trusting ourselves to others without fear. And fully serving the interest of others, we find our own interest. That's the gospel. That's the core of the Christian faith. Anybody tells you anything else is not telling you the truth. See, Jesus is not like an idol that you take him along as your friend and you put him in your pocket and when you need him, when you get into crisis, you get him out and say, please, Jesus, and then you put him back again. No, 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 no. Jesus himself said, until you lose your life, you cannot find it. What does he mean by that? Until you be, as John the Baptist said, that I must decrease and that he must increase in me, you can't find true fulfillment. And I lived on both sides of that argument. I can tell you the truth of what I'm preaching. If you'd like to learn how to know God in a personal way, ask for the booklet, Finding the Joy You've Always Wanted. It will tell you of God's love for you and explain how to experience His forgiveness.
If you have a personal relationship with God and you're interested in walking closer with Him, the booklet Seven Steps in Your Faith Adventure will help guide you into a deeper fellowship with your Heavenly Father. Ask for your free booklet.